come down and Narendra Modi's uh, closely followed visit to the United States, the Indian Prime Minister and the US President have set Indo-US ties on a higher plane, pledging to push bilateral relationships to new levels to discuss what this could mean for Indo-US ties going forward and how it will benefit both the Indian and American corporations. Uh, I'm being joined by Nisha Charya of Gateway House. Uh, Nish, thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, let me start off by talking to you first and foremost as far as Prime Minister Modi who met with a dozen chiefs of a US business, CEOs of companies like uh, Caterpillar, Boeing, PepsiCo uh, and General Electric and he said that he wants to liberalize the country's economy to play catch on as far as growth goes and beyond really lip service. How far do you think that American companies will be convinced about his seriousness to do this? Right, right. So I think we need to separate out business into two categories. I think for the Fortune 500 companies, they have some real concerns about regulatory issues in India, corruption, uh, infrastructure. Uh, but those companies tend to only look for the big opportunities, the billion dollar markets, the billion dollar products for India. And in that sense, the issues they have are much more uh, relevant around infrastructure, supply chain. I think if you get past the Fortune 500, really the Fortune 50, and look to the vast majority of American business, which is small business uh, of 500 employees and less, uh, growth companies in the startup space, I think they look at India very differently and see the emerging middle class, the emerging youth market, the mobile connectivity. And they're looking at that as an opportunity. And they're a little bit less concerned about infrastructure uh, and regulatory loopholes. In fact, they're more sort of bullish about India in terms of e-commerce and mobile solutions and those sort of things, smart cities. So I think you really have to separate the legitimate concerns of the Fortune 500 that the government must deal with with the opportunity that the broader private sector uh, is seeing in India. Hmm. You know, you've been talking about the smaller Fortune 50 companies, uh, but there could be a significant number of research and technology companies in that space nation. And, you know, that really is the concern. There seems to be some reluctance amongst them to share with India without stronger IP laws in place. Where do you see that going? So, again, I think there's two, two important ways to think about this. I think in the short term, India has stated its position, uh, and there's widespread political and business support for that in India. And so for American companies, I think moving towards a tiered pricing model the way that uh, Abbott uh, Labs and Gilead Pharmaceuticals has, that seems to be a more successful strategy for maintaining uh, intellectual property uh, in the United States, Western Europe, elsewhere, but licensing with Indian partners just for India. And that seems to be a, a strategy that has a lot of promise. Uh, on the other end of the scheme, I think that's where entrepreneurship becomes important. Because I think if India develops 10 biotech companies with drugs that need approval from the FDA, seek patents, uh, and are looking to become global, I think you'll see much more alignment between the goals of Indian business and American business. So I think there's the immediate issue uh, where we need to find a third pathway because the American way doesn't work, the Indian way doesn't work for this situation. Uh, but there's the future which, where there's a lot of Indian biotechs that are uh, gunning for the global market. And how do you get those goals aligned by having uh, those biotechs grow and succeed? That's where American investment, entrepreneurial ecosystems, all of that becomes, I think, very important. So in that sense, Nish, you know, you've seen Prime Minister Modi, of course, when he unveiled that Make in India campaign, saying they're going to ease up doing business in India. How far do you think the Prime Minister will, you know, use this and be successful in spurring investments into India? So I think he's certainly, from a political sense, uh, hitting the right notes there by talking about Make in India. Uh, I think there, you know, the proof is in the pudding, as we say in the United States. I think uh, business will look to see whether there is real investment in infrastructure uh, and uh, regulatory change so that particularly issues around the labor law, uh, labor laws in India are addressed by uh, prime minister and parliament in coming years. So I think the make it India from the large sectors, from the large companies, uh, the proof is still in the pudding. We're still waiting to see what happens. In terms of smaller manufacturers, I think the opportunity is to say, uh, let's look at a leapfrog technology like 3D printing. Uh, and for one lakh rupees, you can put a 3D printer in a village. So how does that fit into the manufacturing strategy? And how can we bring in something where America is very strong, uh, these new technologies like 3D printing, and make it a part of the make it in India strategy? Uh, is, it a, is it a possibility? Is it not a possibility? What are the training requirements? These are the questions I think uh, people will be asking. But I think a lot of people will be looking at leapfrog technologies, um, smart manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, as a way that supplements 
large labor intensive manufacturing that the Prime Minister has focused on? I noticed that you've previously served in the Obama administration uh, as a director of innovation and also a entrepreneurship and uh, senior advisor to the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, Nish, with that background, give us a sense of how the U.S. now perceives India as a business partner after this visit. Right. So I, I've recently done a report with Gateway House, which I think you referred to earlier uh, from Mumbai. And one of the things we've highlighted is that this is actually now, for the first time, really a two-way relationship. You're seeing Indian companies uh, in the IT sector increase headcount in the United States. You're seeing the Mahindras and the Tatas uh, develop entire lines of business in the United States. So I think that's the first thing that we're noticing uh, in the U.S. government more broadly, which is in the White House, commerce, elsewhere, is that this is really a, a two-way trade uh, today, much more so than before. And then secondly, I think that uh, at commerce and elsewhere, we've realized that the capabilities of India uh, continue to grow exponentially in the sense that Indian workers are now very globally connected and able to complete comp complex business projects for multinationals, uh, that India has these multinationals, uh, and that the cost of business is going down significantly. So many American startups tend to leverage India very early on for not just back office ta tasks, but data analytics uh, and, and new things that are uh, new technologies that are coming abroad. So I think we look at India very broadly as a business partner where uh, everything that's new on the horizon in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship will have a strong India component. The bigger question from a policy perspective is uh, for those large uh, Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 1000 companies, will India be a conducive business environment for them to invest uh, and create billion dollar uh, product lines and service lines? Uh, and, and what will the Indian government do to make that easier? Uh, and that's where these issues of intellectual property, taxation, infrastructure come back. And so, again, I think it's a, sort of a twofold, very opportunistic, very uh, optimistic view on, on innovation uh, and then a wait and see approach when it comes to uh, sort of immediate opportunities in energy infrastructure, what have you. A quick last word, you know, editorials both uh, globally and back home are divided about who has seen the most impact, whether it's the NRIs there in the U.S. or whether it is, uh, you know, the American community that uh, Prime Minister Modi has reached out to. What's your assessment? So I think it's, it's been a success on, on the three fronts that it was supposed to be a success on. The first is the prime minister established that he had a uh, base of, of fans, not necessarily a base of power, but a, but a base of fans in the United States with the events at Madison Square Garden. And I think that's important not just in India, but uh, in America to show that uh, you know, American citizens are globally minded. They tend to connect with their uh, country of origin. And so I think that was very important to, to highlight and showcase in the way that it was done. Uh, secondly, I think the Prime Minister has done a very good job of turning India's, uh, the criticisms of India into positives. So he often talked about the youth bulge uh, and that, that this is an opportunity, uh, not a problem. He talked about cleaning up the Ganga River uh, and things like that and that these need to be done. They're opportunities, not problems, energy. So I think he was very good at twisting that uh, into uh, opportunities. And then I think from the business community and the policy community, I think what he's done is he's developed a personal rapport and a sense of trust. Uh, I think that's the most you can do as a new prime minister coming off a, a few years of real uh, frustration by Americans uh, is to develop that rapport and that trust that, uh, you know, the prime minister is serious and that his team is serious uh, and that, you know, wait and see for new, new changes in policy and investment that uh, uh, people will be happy with. And I would just say also he's been firm about the things where he doesn't agree, like uh, intellectual property uh, and the role of the U.S. in, in determining uh, sort of global policy. So I think he's stuck to his guns, but also said he's somebody that he can work with. So hopefully that will lead to a change in investment and uh, uh, collaboration climate.